the uh, gel coat and our uh, putty that we put in the crevices are all dried in the molds. So I wanted to go over with what we have to do next is cut our fiberglass material. This happens to be a one and a half ounce fiberglass matting. Um, I prefer matting in this situation simply because matting is, uh, when it's laid up, it is so much stronger of a material. Um, it's not a weight saving material, but it is uh, a much stronger um, with fewer layers required versus uh, a cloth, um, which is uh, you know, a bi-directional um, weave basically. Um, and it typically requires uh, a, a multitude of layers in order to get the same strength that the, uh, the matting would have. So anyways, we're using the one and a half ounce matting and then I have templates here because I produce this tank quite a bit. So I have made fixed templates to cut my materials. Um, generally how I start out is once I make the mold, I use uh, like packaging paper um, or newspaper or something of that nature. And I, I start laying it out inside of the molds um, and then cutting it so the I don't have excess overlap. So as it's bending, it's changing its shape. So you have to uh, cut slits or uh, remove material. So when it makes the angle that the parts meet up or have a, a light overlap, I generally do a light overlap. Um, so all of the, these two templates, um, sets these two molds up to be so for this particular the top portion of the tank this would be the actual uh, template for that and as you can see the removal of the materials to allow these two sections to be bent up and joined together uh, and then it has a slit down in here so I usually cut this out with my jigsaw and this is just some cheap plywood uh, and in order to continuously use it over and over and over. Uh, well, this particular one is for the underside of the tank. It's not many places that because it folds outwards versus inwards. So it has just a lot of uh, slots to allow the forming or the parts to overlap these little fingers. Um, so what we do now is we have to cut it each one of these uh, pieces here requires a total of four pieces cut like each of these shapes so it'll be two pieces for one side of the tank two pieces for the other side of the tank and I do mine in two layers so I'm gonna get these cut up when we come back we'll go over start and get ready to do our fiberglass all right here we are um, I went ahead and I have all of our panels cut there's uh, like I said four of each side um, so there's two layers on one side, two layers on the other side of the mold. I typically lay my tank up in sides simply because vinyl ester resin is kind of, it's not like polyester. So you have a minimum amount. It's more like epoxy. You have a minimum amount of catalyst that you can add and you only have a specific working time with it. And your working time is going to decrease, decrease dramatically depending on how warm your temperatures are. So I do not suggest doing any fiberglass work in the direct sunlight because that's going to directly affect the curing times of your resins. Um, right now I'm in the, the winter months. I'm in my shop. My shop's in the probably the low 60s, mid 60s uh, temperature range. So I should get a decent working time with it. Uh, and by far follow the mixing instructions per the bottle. The brand I typically use is called Fiberlay. Um, I order it online and this company puts their label on there, um, but the part number is still identical to the Fiberlay version. Um, I'm not familiar with other brands. I haven't used other brands. I have used with success the Fiberlay brand. Um, so also I, I didn't cover in the previous talking about cutting the materials. Also cut some two inch strips and these are pre-measured out. This goes for the top uh, top half of the tank and I'll kind of briefly go over a little bit. When I make my fuel tanks, you know, the, the cured thickness of the wall is going to be about two millimeters thick. Definitely strong. But what I like to do is I use these strips to put them in the corners or where there's creases in the tank. So I overlap, you know, center, the crease into that strip 
and I lay the strips in there. Um, and then also the way this tank here mounts to the motorcycle uh, being its aftermarket, there's a push button that goes to the very back. So I add another square layer to give it complete three layers in the back for allow the customer to be able to you know, push the tank on. So it adds a, a great amount of strength adding that extra layer, but I don't want the weight in the tank because the tank is going to get a internal coating once this is uh, done, but we'll go over that later. So anyways, so we're gonna get the uh, materials uh, mixed up and start prepping. And this side is the side that I do first as far as the, this side of the tank. And I lay up one half because this mold has to lay on its side when I lay it up to allow the excess to wanna hang off the side. If you laid it directly up, your material will collapse in on you um, simply because of the weight of the resin. So don't attempt to try to lay something that has direct sides without prior experience of laying this tank up. Um, or whatever you're going to lay up. Like I so said, for me, I lay it up on its side. I'll do one half, which will overlap the center line of this tank, and then allow it to cure while it's still green. Being it's cured and it's becoming stiff, I will flip the tank over and do the other side, and then that'll allow the overlaps to bond together at a much better, rather than letting the the uh, components you know, cure for a couple days. I'd, I lay it out while it's still green. So anyways, I forgot one thing I wanted to note real quick. The types of rollers that I use for laying up these tanks. Simply, there's I use basically all of these. Um, I have a uh, semi-rounded uh, roller. These are obtained eBay, Amazon. And then my trusty old three-quarter inch economy. This is plastic. And I've had this thing for over 20 years. Um, I, I really like the plastic ones over the aluminum, but it's hard to find different styles that'll be in the plastic form. So if you're able to find them in plastic, the plastic's so much nicer. So if you actually uh, have an accident where you mix too much catalyst or anything like that and it starts to cure on you, it's easier to get the dried up fiberglass resin out of the plastic versus the aluminum. The aluminum, you can do it by heating it up and actually digging it out. But I find a scribe and I'm able to just Take it out really simple um, a lot of these have different purposes one is for uh, much quicker travels or longer uh, spans of trying to work air bubbles out that's generally what this one's for and i use this one for a majority of the actual work which would be all on the sides like this and then this one right here is done for in the corners up in here trying to help that this one here is for the coming up where there's light corners. You know, there's a small edge like so. This gets down in that end of that corner really easy. So it helps pull this around. And I also find that um, when you have lots of small micro bubbles that I can't really get out, I'm not having success with this one. I'm able to move really slow and pull it out with these. So this one's another one that I really use a lot. So between these two right here, that's a majority of the work. This one here is in very tight places like corners that you're trying to work an air bubble out that you can't get any of these physical tools. This is a homemade tool. It's just a piece of brass rod that I drilled a whole piece of aluminum shank and then press it down in there. And then it's got a slight bend to it so it allows me to work at different angles. So anyways, I'm gonna get the met resin mixed up and we will get started. What we'll do first, because I'm going to do a, a speed video for this, um, I'm going to lay up the corners first in here. Those will get laid down first. And then first layer will go on. And then once the first layer is, uh, is uh, somewhat saturated, um, and then I'll lay the second layer over the top of that. And then we will begin to work the, um, the air bubbles out. Bear in mind, on this particular size tank, which is about a five and a half or five gallon tank, I can get two fuel tanks made out of this, but I've done, and this is a one gallon size, but I've made so many of these tanks, I've figured out the amount of material that I need in order to lay this tank up. So if you are making a tank in similar size, you may not achieve the same results. It may take you almost a whole gallon because you're 
unfamiliar and you end up mixing more and wasting it. So, you know, practice makes perfect. All right, we have our material mixed up. Um, I find that the stuff bubbles uh, when you apply this stuff, but the bubbles do pop and they go away and it won't affect your stuff between the cure of the layout. I use disposable uh, two inch chip, chip brushes that pick up Harbor Freight or anywhere, big box store, they got them, they're disposable. So when I'm one use, I throw it away. So we're gonna get started because I ain't got time to gab because we do have a time clock now. So we'll get started and go from there. So I'll let you watch the speed motion. We are got this one laid up um, you've probably seen there's a lot of transitioning back and forth there's a lot of work when laying this up as I noted earlier in the video that air bubbles underneath this glass against your gel coat is really bad um, really tiny air bubbles not as much but larger air bubbles yes uh, when they heat up they're going to expand and you're going to see that surface imperfection on a finished product so basically I've used all my uh, bubble rollers to push the air bubbles out. You've seen where I took some scrap uh, material and I created little swatches to, because the way the uh, screws line up in here, they're down on the center line. So I put extra swatches over the tops of those screw uh, points right here to help give it some structure to form around that and not get the top two up here simply to when the next on the other side those layers are going to override over that and we're not going to have that issue um, i did you seen where i added the strips in here the only strip that i did not add was this back plate here um, i'll do that once the other side is laid up and then i can lay it over because it's a single layer um, and the chances of getting you know having air bubbles that i can't keep out against that surface will be uh, much harder so I wait until I get the next layer on and then overlap that onto this layer because any micro air bubbles on this side here I'm not too worried about um, so the the big swatch that goes back here will be done once we lay the other side on um, the flange is really crucial um, you see where I added some extra resin onto the this edge here but basically down here because when you are working your air bubbles out you tend to squeeze a lot of the resin out of there so it gets really thin here so i usually add a little bit of resin to the edge so it'll help uh, give it a little bit more thickness um, because i do grind this down um, this surface here when we go to join them which we'll later discuss but for the most part you've seen why i did that and like i said the main part is working the air bubbles out if you try to do both sides at one time, you're gonna find yourself, especially if something that you need to be conscious of, of bubbles, um, you'll find that you're having to work way too fast um, and you can't pay you know, a, a lot of strict attention to the uh, one side. I'm a perfectionist, so I tend to wanna make sure I get all the air bubbles out. I don't want my customers to have to, when they do their uh, prep work, 
and they find a void, I don't want them to have to do any body work.